Hey everyone! Hi guys! Welcome back to the Global Quarantine Diary. Today we are back in UK and focus on the film industry. Our guest tonight is Stuart Hazeldine. He directed movies Exam and The Shack, which are very relevant in the current circumstances. He will tell us what he's working on right now and how the movie industry is adapting. There we go. This is yes, Hello. Well. <laughs> it's nice to see the lovely British uh, background behind you. <laughs> and yeah. what about my background? <laughs> uh, yeah, your background is cool. Like this one makes me feel at home. That one looks like you're from a movie, uh, which also <laughs> yeah. fits me. So. <laughs> so, you guys know each other, right? Yes, yes, we've known each other for years. Uh, we met in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, Anastasia is an amazing uh, cultural tour guide. Um, <laughs> she showed me many amazing parts of Moscow in the center and out on, in the smaller places where we found uh, things I think uh, most tourists would never discover. Um, but uh, she's yeah, very it's always great to have a local <laughs> who can yeah, show those places. Exactly, it was great. But I, I actually know you longer than you know me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay. all it's all because of your movie exam oh. there you go. yes yes you knew my work <laughs> a little bit of my brain was in that movie yes so it was a big surprise to find out that you were the director of that movie so life can be surprising sometimes <laughs> you it never can know be you yes i think if you are an actor in a film uh, people instantly recognize you. But uh, my face is not in the movie, so uh, I never get that in the street, but sometimes maybe in an Uber cab, uh, the driver will ask me what I do, and then I end up saying that I made this movie, and they go, oh wow, I watched that movie in my school, film school class, you know, and then they go crazy. But you still get to do the coolest things, but just have your privacy also, right? Exactly. Yes, you, you really hit the nail on the head. That is why I love my job. It's mm -hmm. perfect. You get to be famous for a very small amount of time, but then you go to the supermarket and no one interrupts you. And now it's uh, actually very good not to be interrupted in the supermarkets. <laughs> yes, right now yeah. you don't want to be stopped. <laughs> you don't want anybody to be talking in your face. Everyone is trying to stay very far apart from each other. We gradually come to the whole um, topic, the whole theme of our discussion today. Yes. So, um, tell us how you feel and uh, what is happening right now in the UK. Well, what's very strange is seeing it go around the world in stages. Uh, obviously, Wuhan in China was the first stage. Uh, and then it began in Europe with Italy. And we saw it coming closer. And we knew that it was coming here and uh, America at the same time. And so then we went through the fire and we're now coming out of the other side of the first wave. And now we're watching uh, Latin America and Brazil going through the fire. And we don't know, you know, is Africa to come uh, or not? Africa doesn't seem to be taking off very much and that's good for them. Uh, and we don't know if a second wave will happen. So everyone is looking at, you know, a different part of the world, depending upon what the month is. Um, but it's uh, it's it's been a very strange time. If you if I think if human beings lived for two hundred years instead of eighty years, uh, we would experience a couple of these things in our lifetime, and it wouldn't be a surprise. But the reality is, the last time something like this happened was a hundred years ago for mm -hmm. the whole world. Mm -hmm. So even our grandparents can't remember experiencing this. It's there in the history books. We can pick up a book and read about it, but no one can tell you, oh yes, I remember this. So it's just been strange. And I write and I do a lot of research. And in Exam, Exam is a, a, a film that is set during a pandemic. It's set during a global pandemic when lots of people are dying. And one of the reasons why some of the characters in the movie want to get the job is because the only vaccine comes from working for the health company that made it. If you join this company, you get the vaccine. It's not about the answer, it's about the question. So has anyone figured out the answer yet? If you choose to leave this room for any reason, you will be disqualified. <laughs> 
so I did a lot of research at the time because the bird flu had just happened and there was a short period of time where the bird flu almost turned into this. Uh, it was very close. There was a, a few moments in like some small huts in the jungles of Thailand where <coughs> they thought that maybe the disease had gone from human to human, not just from bird to human, but human to human. And all the scientists were descending on the village and walling off the village because if it went human to human, it would turn into the coronavirus it's level of pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I was reading about this and we didn't have Twitter or a lot of things back then, but we had some social media. And at the time, I, I sensed that if it happened, it would happen very bad and very quickly. And I actually bought um, a pandemic survival kit. This is uh, 12 years ago, and they were sending out these sort of plastic things, and they had uh, masks in, the proper respirator N95 masks, uh, Tamiflu, which you needed if it was a flu, not a coronavirus, uh, and um, other kinds of little drugs and things, and I got some stocked up with some uh, cans of, of food, because I thought, you know, if this turns into a pandemic, it, within a few weeks, we're going to be panic buying. Everything's going to go crazy because I knew it was going to happen. One day I knew this was going to happen and I knew it would happen in my lifetime. There was no way that we would go for another 30 or 40 years with no pandemic. So there were a few near misses, the bird flu, the swine flu, SARS, MERS, like it all kind of almost took off. And I think everybody started getting a, a false sense of security because they started thinking, oh, you know, these things happen, and then they just put a ring around it, and it only really affects one town in China. And then, of course, this time, finally, it didn't happen. Um, but because I knew the way things went, about two weeks before all the panicking in the UK, before everyone ran into the supermarket and were buying the, the toilet, toilet paper, paper <laughs> all these things, uh, I, was, I had already bought it all. Um, uh, I sound like I'm sort of crummy. there was nothing left for those people because yeah, you exactly. bought it all. I bought everything. No, I bought what I, I bought what I needed. Um, so I bought the food. Uh, I had a haircut. I had a car wash. I all the things that I needed to do that I wouldn't need to. So I didn't need to do them for two or three months. I did all those things, and. All my family thought I was crazy again. <laughs> and then it happened. And, uh, you know, a little bit later, one of them said to me privately, okay, you, this time you were right. <laughs> do you still have your uh, survival kit from 12 years ago? I do, yes. Uh, the Tamiflu is long expired and it wouldn't work. Uh, but actually, the masks do work. The masks are also out, or out of date, but if you've never worn them, effectively they work and it was important to be ready simply because it was the if you caught it in that first month or, or two months uh you would you risked going to a hospital when the hospitals were crazy and they had no time to treat you and they didn't know what to do they didn't have the equipment they didn't understand the disease if i got it tomorrow i would feel a lot better because i know that they have the equipment they understand the disease much better now there are spare beds uh, I would I would much rather have it now. <laughs> so uh, I, I think finally, uh, after all this time, we've been playing catch up and catch up for months with not enough equipment and not enough knowledge. But now we're getting there. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like we are past uh, the worst days of, of, of ignorance, of not no knowledge. But equipment and masks is still a problem in many places. I know people who are working in our government who normally they're working on all kinds of different things. But six weeks ago, in the middle of the lockdown, they were all working on the same thing. Everyone was on the phone, calling around the world, trying to find as many masks and visors as they could possibly find. Even if you were supposed to be working on um, sport or you know, taking out the trash from the street. Suddenly, if you're in a government building, they give you a phone and they say, Call around the world and ask if anyone has masks, we'll buy them. Write a check, here's your credit card number of the government, buy this thing. Uh, you really follow this, uh, the news uh, around uh, pandemic, uh, your Facebook uh, timeline is filled with all these articles. So that's an interesting topic for you, right? Yeah, I, I do think it's fascinating. I think it's really important right now to get the best information out at the right time. 
for me, I, I can say it's my job. You know, that's something that I actually do for a, a living is, is try and find information. So uh, I was just looking for things. I, I do look for things that I think need to uh, just get out there and will make people think differently. You're not always right. Sometimes you post something that turns out to be disproved or you, or, or whatever, but I, I don't care. I don't really mind about getting it wrong occasionally. Some people think that unless you have perfect knowledge and you know exactly what is right, that you shouldn't post it. But right, right now, uh, everyone is sort of learning. You know, we're just learning as the days go by. So you just do your best, learn as fast as you can, make sure everyone is talking and arguing. The arguing is good. You know, like I, I, don't, I don't mind people disagreeing and arguing because sometimes a new thought can come out of the argument. So a little bit of a fight can sometimes be helpful, you know. So you must have heard of that uh, YouTube video, which was uh, then taken down. Oh, yes. You mean the pandemic? Yeah. yeah. So what yeah. do you think about it? Uh, I instantly knew that that was not uh, a good one. Um, first of all, it's very hard to make a 20-minute video uh, of anything right in the middle of a crisis and have it be good. But you just get a sense for um, how many experts are they talking to? Uh, what is the history of these experts? If There's always a few doctors, a few scientists, who have a history of always having a different opinion to the mass of people. Uh, and so they turn up uh, being uh, worried about this and worried about vaccines and they complain about this and they, they tend to uh, advance conspiracy theories that say that, um, you know, you can't trust the governments, you can't trust the media. I'm not a big believer in conspiracy theories because for a conspiracy to work, uh, it means it's a secret and people have to keep that secret. And the more people sh share one secret and keep it, the harder it is to keep that secret because someone is going to spill it. So if, if a conspiracy needs two or four people to work, then okay, maybe it works. But some people think conspiracy theories are shared by a whole government or all the media of the world. And when that happens, it says more about the person's beliefs than about reality because people are naturally suspicious and they worry that the people in power are planning something to control them or to destroy them. And uh, I think that's a bad kind of fear. I think that uh, conspiracy theories are a bit like a parasite. It preys on your mind and you have to resist these things sometimes. So, um, yeah, so I've been fighting back on some of those things. I, I, think, I think they're not helpful. And what are the top news stories in the UK right now? Oh, the top stories. Well, um, the big story for the last few days has been the advisor of our government who uh, broke the rule. Uh, he, cr he created the rule. He helped to come up with this rule of the lockdown and uh, you can't leave your home. You can't go to your second home in the country if you are rich to your dacha, you know, or whatever you call it in, in Russia. You have to stay in Moscow in your flat. No, no dacha. Um, so, uh, but he was naughty and he went to his dacha. Uh, and he gave an excuse, and it was a bad excuse. Nobody believes this excuse. Oh, uh, what was the excuse? Oh, he said that uh, he was worried that he would get sick, and so his children had no one to look after them. So he wanted to drive up to the north of England to stay in his father in his father's castle. His father owns a castle, uh, oh. and uh, there was a, another house on the grounds of the castle. And he was staying in there, but they ended up being no childcare, so that wasn't a very good excuse. And then he was spotted visiting another castle uh, on his wife's birthday, and uh, he was spotted walking in, around the castle in the woods with his wife and his children. And some people nodded and recognised him and said hello. Uh, and they reported this to the papers. And uh, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to just go and visit, you know, something, especially when you're sick. That's bad. You're spreading the the virus. Um, but the problem is he's a very powerful advisor. He's the most powerful advisor that a British prime minister has ever had. And uh, a lot of people in the party, they think he has too much power. And a lot of people in the country think he has too much power. Uh, no, no advisor should be that powerful because we don't elect the advisor. We elect the, the politicians, the members of parliament. So a lot of people want him to go. Um, but the prime minister doesn't want him to go. So... Um, it's that's all anyone is talking about that's the whole news 
So what about the film industry? It changed probably due to the circumstances. What is going on now (laughs) there? Well, for me, uh, it didn't change too much because at the moment I'm writing. And to write, you just need to be at home in your office. But I had, uh, but you go through cycles. Sometimes you're writing, sometimes you're shooting. I was very uh, lucky to just be writing right now. Many of my friends were not so lucky. They were shooting. Uh, Hmm. They were about to shoot. They were in the middle of shooting. Often they were in a country that is not their own country. And they had to get home. I had an actor friend in El Salvador shooting a movie, a friend producing a movie in Spain, but she's American. Uh, another friend from America shooting in Tokyo. They all had their things shut down and they had to get on the plane. Sometimes they were on like the last flight out of their country. So uh, I felt very bad for them. It's very strange. They don't know if they're gonna be, when they're going back. Uh, Some of them have to, they're halfway through. So they have to go back and finish the rest. And they don't know uh, because of availability or because of uh, maybe some people got sick with the virus. They don't know if they're going to go back with entirely the same crew. Maybe, uh, obviously, the actors. Yes, um, you have to. You have to <laughs> go back with your stars. But you know, if the sound guy uh, got sick or took another job, uh, maybe uh, there's a different sound guy. Maybe twenty percent of your crew changed. So that that is a little bit strange. And so now everyone is just figuring out. How do we go back? You know, how do we uh, get the business going again? Because shooting a a film is very different than shooting a 10 episode TV show is very different than a soap opera that needs to do two episodes every week. They're all a bit different. There are some things that are the same. Everything needs a camera. Everything needs hair and makeup. But uh, some of these things, they shoot forever. Some of them can be shot in six weeks. Some of them can be shot with small crews. But if you're making a Marvel movie, you have a crew of a thousand. So uh, it's not really one solution for everyone. There are many working groups in every film industry, the British film industry, Hollywood. I'm sure there are some filmmakers in Russia who are figuring out their special things. And I'm not really on any of these groups, but I know people who are. So I just look at their documents, you know, the first draft, and then they send it out for comments. For a few weeks, everybody says, well, I don't think this will work. I think we need to look at this. And then they bring out a new draft. So I hope that very soon we will have a new code of conduct standards and practices of what we should do but the big problem is no one can guarantee complete safety in the workplace Mm. we just we just can't we can't guarantee that if you come and work on this movie that you won't catch the virus on the film set just as you can't guarantee it that your kids won't get it at school um, or mm-hmm. any other office environment. There is no complete safety. You know, many businesses, they have adjusted because they can, because in the supermarket, you just can tell the customers, stay apart, keep a distance. Of course, in the movie industry, yes. it's not the case. But what do you think is going to be the solution to all this? Well, here's the biggest uh, thing that I think everyone is discussing is that uh, in order to make social distancing work on a film set, you're going to need to add uh, more time uh, onto your days and onto your shooting schedule in in total. Uh, And you're gonna need to buy uh, new things, buy new products, uh, cleaning products. You're gonna need to nominate uh, one or two uh, sort of COVID marshals on your set whose job it is to take the tests and the temperatures and check that everyone is okay. They're always testing and cleaning. Uh, So everyone just has to be a lot more careful about what they do. And uh, the general uh, belief that I'm hearing is that it's going to add about 20% on on time and money onto uh, a set. So for every five days that you shoot, you have to add one day just for the COVID things. Um, And so over the course of a shoot and a 35 day shoot becomes a 40 day shoot or something like that. So that, that is more money uh, until we um, have a vaccine uh, in which case then it all goes away or some very good drug that you can have immediately that uh, you still get sick, but you get well much quicker, you know, and nobody ends up dying or something like that. Uh, Until that happens, so I think the next year, the next 12 months is gonna be more expensive. If you wanna make something, you gotta spend more money. 
And I think there's only two real ways uh, to get around that. One is you're a big Hollywood studio making a huge superhero movie where you're just spending so much money anyway that it probably doesn't make that much difference. <laughs> you can shut the movie down care. again yeah. if there's a second wave in October, you, you know, you, you, because you know that when the movie finally comes out, it's going to gross a billion dollars, then that will keep your studio going for a long time. Or you make a very small movie and you just have a very small unit and you keep away and you, you maybe you shoot everything in one house, <laughs> you know, or something like that. So um, I think that's going to be uh, the way that you do it. But all those movies in the middle, they're not full of money, but they're also, it's very hard for them to be small. That's going to be tough. If you want to make a movie that has lots of scenes uh, with big crowds, or if you want to make a love story where a man and woman are kissing all the time, uh, it's, things like that are going to be difficult. <laughs> oh, they have <laughs> so to be tested like the then. Right like... story. <laughs> yes, they have to be tested every day. They have to... You have to hire an actor and an uh, actor who are already living together, husband and wife. <laughs> so there are some things in movie stories that are harder to shoot uh, now, and some things are still quite easy. Um, so we're all thinking about this. You know, I, I have a story in my head that would take place during this lockdown. You know, I think a, a lot of storytellers get an idea in their head uh, because of this because you could tell a hundred different stories of what is happening now. Some could be comedies, some could be horror stories, some could be very sad dramas, and they're all real. You know, they're all, they could all be uh, really powerful films. Probably after the vaccine, people will not want to think about this. They'll want to watch movies set in space or in the far, in the past, or something that makes them escape from this world. But there will come a time where people want to think about it you know just as uh, every move every war that gets fought a little bit afterwards the movies come out the vietnam war 9 11 uh, after a while hollywood or the local industry wants to make a movie that, it, that looks back at this big thing that affected everyone uh, and that will happen with this pandemic for sure it's just a case of who makes it and is it a good story um but i, I have an idea but I, I haven't started writing it yet because i feel like it's still happening like the story is still being told so i know the beginning of my story but i don't know how it ends mm -hmm. and depending how it ends it could be a horror or a thriller or a comedy so <laughs> are you talking about your new script uh no uh my new script i, I have been working on a script in lockdown but it was something that i planned before before this all happened um only a little bit before um but it's it's interesting because it is a very cheap movie that could be made close to my house in london with a very small crew and a very small number of actors so in that sense by accident it would be a story that might actually be good to make in the next 12 months because it doesn't have big crowd scenes or, or anything so I think it, it it could actually be made soon um, and so I've been working on that and, and it was very difficult in the early days of lockdown to concentrate uh, mm -hmm. like the first month the first week of the lockdown uh, was it was pretty much the same week in the UK as in the US and so a lot of my friends in Hollywood who also write scripts we were all messaging and on Twitter and WhatsApp and and uh, everyone was saying the same thing in the first week, which is this should be good for us. Like the whole world is being forced to do what we do for a living. We isolate for a living. We stay at home and we work. Um, but is it is it just me or can none of us really concentrate right now? And everyone said, no, it's not just you. We're all like that. None of us can concentrate. There's so much going on, worrying about your parents and your friends and the news you're just watching the news every day and none of us were getting any but i think in the second week i started to work and uh, and it was good to think about a different story um i was telling a story that is set in london before the pandemic before all of these worries came um but i'm not as productive as before let's say before i was doing five pages a day now I'm doing three pages a day. Um, so yes, I, I did finish one script uh, and now I'm working on a television project, which uh, I'm actually being uh, paid to write for a studio in Hollywood. So I'm doing a bit of work on that now uh, to make it better. 
Uh, but this pandemic thing is in the background. It's like uh, planning, you know, I'm not writing, but I'm just planning it. I have taken a few days to try and shape the story. Is this going to work or not? Um, I'm still not sure. I'm on the fence. And you know. haven't decided whether it's going to be a, a movie or a series or maybe a short film? I think it will be a movie. Uh, I think I'm not a big fan of short films because they don't make any money, to be honest. You can put them on YouTube and six billion people can watch them, <laughs> but no one's going to pay you any money. But if you make a feature film, uh, even if it's cheap, but if you make a good feature film for 90 minutes, two hours, uh, that can go all over the world, can earn you money, you could win Oscars, you could do whatever. I, anyone in a, film, in a film school could do that. Uh, and right now we have the most amazing uh, access because the equipment is so cheap, you can shoot a feature film on your iPhone. You know, just this little phone, uh, you, can, uh, you can shoot movie quality video that could actually look good on a cinema screen if you put the right setting. You shoot it in full 4K, we call it a raw setting. Uh, you can actually shoot a whole movie on your on your iPhone. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm doing as well. I think my next film uh, will either be shot on, on this or it will be shot on um, a small camera that looks like a stills camera, but is actually a movie camera. Um, you can get very good image quality now. So I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities of, of doing that, getting a small crew together. If you write a good script, you can sometimes get big actors. Maybe they're sitting in London, they can't get mm. on the plane to go and shoot the next Marvel movie. They want to shoot something close to home. Uh, and, you know, I already made two movies, so I probably know what I'm doing. Uh, and if they like the script, I'll say, look, it's not, I'm not a lot of money. Uh, I can't pay you a lot of money. I'm going to do this from my bank account. Uh, but I think we can shoot this whole thing in like three weeks. Because sometimes with these big Hollywood movies, it, you, you know, it takes months of getting ready and rehearsing and practicing sword fighting. Uh, and then you, you're on a five month shoot. Whereas if you come up with a cool little thing, you can, you can just rehearse it in one week. You can shoot it in three weeks, done. You've shot a whole movie in one month. Uh, and suddenly if you're an actor, you put two movies out a year, suddenly you put three movies out. Three chances to have a good movie instead of two. Do you think because of the current situation, because everything is put on break, most of the things, that yeah. there is going to come the time when we, the viewers, going to sit there and have no new movies coming out. Yes, yes, I do. I think that's possible. Um, I, I don't know if it will go down to zero, but I do think that you will see a, a drop off. Right now, Netflix and Amazon are adding a new show every week, uh, like they normally do, because they have new shows ready in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So the, the gap is not now. The gap is August or mm -hmm. September when they start to run dry and they'll start to buy movies from other countries maybe. There are a lot of finished movies that are mm -hmm. sitting on a shelf right now because what they normally do is they go to a big film festival like Cannes or Toronto or Venice and uh, they would normally show at that festival and then everybody would uh, compete to buy it. And so you want to show it to everyone at the same time in a big room because then they all run out on their phones and they say, I want it. I'm bidding five million for that movie. And someone else says, no, I want six million. And you drive the price up and that's how you sell your movie to, to the world. Um, and right now, uh, it, it, either Netflix are going to buy it and just say, we're taking it off the table and we're just, we don't care how good it is. We just want to put it on the screen and fill the pipeline. Uh, Unless that happens, you're going to wait. You're going to wait. Can has just not happened. Can tried and failed. And uh, Toronto or Venice may happen. They may not happen. Uh, so I think that there's going to be a bit of a, a lot of movies coming out now are going to come out later. Um, and, mm -hmm. and then, so I don't really know. I don't know when the gap's going to appear or how big the gap is, but we know something like that is going to happen. That's another reason why I'm kind of motivated to go out and shoot something very quickly because Maybe your movie comes out when no other movies are coming out and you're the only movie in all of the world that is finished. <laughs> yes. So when you were uh, filming exam, it was, uh, uh, was it really just one space? Uh, yes, the whole movie was shot in one room at one studio. Uh, we did, there's a couple of little shots at the beginning of the movie of uh, the different actors who are like, getting ready for the test, very close up shots of like putting a plaster on and washing your hands. We did shoot those things at a different studio on a different day, much later. We had the actors come back and we did that one little day 
with close-ups. But basically 99% of the movie was all shot in that one room. And so we never had to move the crew anywhere. Uh, and we actually shot also in sequence from the beginning until the end. And very few movies do that. So it felt like a stage play for the actors. They, the, the fact that it was one room and it was beginning to, to the end, they said, this is like a play. This isn't like a movie. And we had some new, new actors and some experienced actors. So the experienced actors would always say to the new actors, you are so lucky to be doing this, to, to be doing one place and beginning to end. So you know where you are and you can follow your emotions changing this is a luxury so just enjoy this because the rest of your career it may not happen but it's just something that came from the the idea i, I always wanted an idea of something that i could not only um have control over but i could finance the movie myself from my own pocket that would give me control and it would give me ownership of the movie when it finished i would own the film so exam is a movie that i own the exam you kind of predict it's uh what it seems to be the future of film, at least in the current circumstances, because yes. <laughs> uh, now more and more directors will have to adapt to this uh, new situation and think of uh, film and everything in just one space. Um, I think you could very easily do a lot of stories just in one house with two or three actors. There are a lot of stories that you could do like that. Um, but you have to be aware that because you can't go to another location and you can't include lots of crowd scenes or visual effects, your story has to be very good. It has to be really interesting and it has to keep having surprises and twists. Otherwise, the audience will get bored. So you either need really good actors or a really good story idea or both. And you remember there was like a trend some years ago uh, when um, it was kind of popular to... Uh, pretend that your movies were filmed uh, um, not professional camera like with yes. your phone or yes, yeah, so maybe exactly. we will see such movies uh, back again <laughs> I think it's very possible that they, they called them found footage because a lot of those things they were pretending that they discovered a video camera in the yes. forest and yes. on the video camera someone died and there was a monster you know so there were a lot of those because of there was a movie called the Blair Witch Project uh, mm -hmm. which was like that and it was so successful it made hundreds of millions of dollars and it only cost twenty thousand dollars to shoot so everyone was like I want to do my own Blair Witch Project uh, and it, it created a fashion and of course all fashions they move off and they they go out of fashion but someone will someone will keep having a, a found footage idea that's good every few years and it will reignite the flame again you know there'll be a new flare up so yeah there will be more found footage movies and most of them will be bad but there will be a couple of good ones i, I wish i had the good one in my head you know <laughs> maybe we will also have uh, more cartoons and uh, yeah. uh films that's uh, like uh, you draw the characters uh, like superheroes or something Yes, that's actually uh, very, very true. And it's happening right now. Uh, there are, uh, on, on all these big movies, there's a combination of real shooting and uh, computer generated effects. And the line producer, the money guy will go through and he will say, okay, we have a 120 page script. 20 pages are VFX uh, and the other 100 pages are actors on the stage. Uh, and I know for sure, because I know people in the visual effects houses, that uh, in the early days of the lockdown, uh, many Hollywood studios were calling them up and saying, so you know that movie we were going to make with 20 pages of visual effects? How many more pages can you turn into visual effects? Like, uh, can you look at these 100 pages of actors? Can you make it 60 pages? Can we do, because that, that for them makes life easier. You know, they just make it from the real world and they move it into visual effects. Any movie now that is all visual effects, like um, Avatar or something like that, that's going to be easier to make than uh, lots of people, you know, big bank robbery movie with lots of actors. And that's hard. But uh, uh, one big stage with a big green screen and uh, maybe two actors and uh, two camera people. And that's the only people on the stage. That's very good for after the lockdown. Actually, again, talking about exam, I just thought, um, were you ever thinking about making part two? <laughs> 
so maybe when they discovered the vaccine and what was happening, maybe you, you could film it in another room. <laughs> well, I kind of feel like part two is going on all around us right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did wonder if there was uh, some uh, some sequel, but I think really for me uh, that particular film it wasn't just about uh, the pandemic or the, the the challenge. It was more my view of life. You know that life is a test, and none of us really know the answer. We all have a blank sheet of paper which symbolizes our lives or the meaning of our lives, and we decide uh, what that meaning is. And we're all a little bit biased by the upbringing of our parents and our culture and our, the politics of our country, a political view. And so we project uh, many of our prejudices onto this blank screen uh, of our lives. And uh, so I just wanted to explore all the characters in, in exam are not real people. They're more like a worldview. Uh, and, um, and, and I kind of finished that story, you know, at the end, because really it was a, a story to say that the world may seem very tough and very competitive, uh, but uh, somewhere in all the, the the rules of the universe that don't seem to care about us, I think that there is uh, kindness and love are more important than maybe we realize, not just in our hearts, but maybe in the whole fabric of the universe. That, that's part of the plan somehow. So don't forget to be kind, you know, even when you're tempted, and that's a good lesson for now, when you're tempted to just look after yourself, and those close to you, just remember that everyone out there is going through some form of fear or restriction or, uh, or imprisonment. Um, so just try and be, be kind. Actually, uh, I mean, I have been sort of working on uh, um, trying to get an uh, exam on a stage as a play. Uh, it has been done many times on stage by small companies and by schools but trying to get an official version together um, that, that I've, I've already written the play script. So it would be nice to see actors on a stage doing it because it's all in one space, so it could, it could work. Um, but just finding the right um, producer and the financier to do that, because I'm not gonna finance that play uh, myself, I don't think. So um, uh, we will we'll see, I, I hope that will happen, but right now is a very bad time to be doing anything as a play because Audiences theater. don't want to get yeah, together in a theatre, so that that's a, a year or two down down the line. And um, talking about your other movie, The Shack, it corresponds with um, the message uh, you were just uh, telling to us about the kindness and the faith. So yeah, it's and true. And also relevant to the situation. I think I'm always attracted to stories about compassion, stories that make people try to be uh, more compassionate and kind to the people around them uh, because it's not always the first instinct of a, of a human to be kind sometimes yes yeah, sometimes no um, you know we're, we're we can all be compassionate to babies and to cute little animals uh, but sometimes we're not compassionate to each other because we don't know the struggles that everyone else is going through um, and I'm as bad at this as anyone else um, I easily get drawn into big angry arguments on Twitter and on whatever um, and I'm I very reactive that way and I don't always understand what someone else is going through so I think I'm always trying to access uh, my own kindness uh, I do have some <laughs> and I'm always trying to find it and bring it out you know um, and so I guess I make those movies uh, for myself but I also hope maybe that it has the same effect on, on other people. So sometimes the way to do that is a warm, uh, you know, religious film like The Shack. Other times it's kind of a cold, tough film like Exam. Um, there are many, many stories that I have got that all kind of have that same theme, but one is a war movie and one is um, a heist movie in a bank and one is this and one is that. Um, but they all kind of have that common thing. Uh, and that's always, I think some filmmakers, the, the common thing is the, the visual look of the movie. They all like their movies to look a certain way. They, like to, they do special things with the camera that only that director does. Um, but I don't really want my, um, my unique thing to be a visual thing. Uh, I like to adopt different styles. Exam is shot in a very different style to The Shack. And I like that. I like reinventing a whole new visual way to shoot a movie. That's a, a fun challenge. But the connection between all my things is more a theme, uh, an idea, than a look. 
So, so for me, that thing of trying to bring out compassion is uh, something that is attractive to me. What so is the thing that you miss the most right now? What would be the first thing you do when everything gets back to normal? of things uh, definitely going out with friends the, the English they like their pubs uh, and uh, in the summer we want to go to the pub even if it's outdoors which is safer just to go out into the beer garden and just have a beer um, so I would like to do that I really like sushi I'm a big fan of sushi because in Los Angeles they eat lots of sushi now raw fish raw, any kind of raw uncooked food is probably more likely to have the virus if you cook it the virus will die so everyone is cooking their food So I, I think I, I miss, I love sushi and I miss having a good sushi meal uh, and traveling. I miss traveling around and seeing new places that I've never visited before. I'm kind of addicted to that uh, as a way of relaxing. Uh, so instead, the only thing I can do is uh, watch a movie every night that I never saw. A classic old movie, maybe black and white. Movies that I always meant to watch, but I never got around to watching this old you know, Humphrey Bogart movie or James Dean film or something. Uh, and now I'm doing that every night, a new movie, and I'm watching all these movies. So uh, I'm in my mind, I'm being taken off somewhere in a movie because I can't travel in reality. Um, but I hope that changes. And I, I look forward to being down in Italy or France with some rosé and <laughs> uh, on a beach. That will be nice. Well, thank you for this uh, great talk. All right, All well, right. Uh, have a good night. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. You too. All right, stay safe. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks for watching us. Hope you enjoyed our episode tonight. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye bye. Till the next time. <laughs>